Today we're going to go through our revolutionary design of a single jacket, single armored, loose tube fiber optic cable designed for direct buried or aerial applications in the outside plant environment. As you can see, we added an orange stripe to the exterior of this cable. We did this for multiple reasons. First off is ready identification. The second reason is if there is multiple operators in your area, how do you identify in an excavation which cable is yours? And last but not least, when your cable is found during an excavation, the orange stripes allows for your customer service representatives to be able to talk to the operator and rapidly understand if it's your cable and an active cable. In addition to the orange stripes, we actually changed the polymers of the jacket. We did this for several reasons. The primary reasons are to facilitate the resistance to mechanical damage. The second reason we did this is to allow for cable memory. When we put this cable into a shape, what you'll notice is it maintains that shape. And it'll allow for much cleaner handholds, uh, cabinets, and any real installations where this cable is going to be exposed and routed. The next feature we're going to discuss is cable entry. In most modern cables, one of the common themes across the industry is, is how difficult it is to enter the cable, whether it be through mid-span access or single point entry. In modern fiber optic cables, as I'm going to access the cable from the end, common practice is to chew away at the end of this cable until I expose the rip cords, and then use the rip cords to open this cable. We realize in the market that the real shortage is labor. So the goal of this cable is to speed up your splicing process and termination process. We're going to open this cable up and show you how easy it is to get into it. So first off, one of the things we did is we tried to match this to the way copper cables used to open. They used to open really easy and it was simple to get into them. So we tried to mimic that. So we'll show you a really unique feature in the sense that I can take this cable and ring it and once I ring it, I can pull the jacket off. It's that simple. And I can continue, I can take two to three feet off at a crack. And you can see it slides off quite easily. There, there wasn't any extra effort. The knife was able to cut through the jacket easily. And you'll also notice where I opened it originally, I didn't cut through the shield. It's because we use a, a high grade aluminum shield. Now that we have the jacket removed, you can see we've exposed the shield. This is important for many reasons. In a single jacket, single armor, direct buried application, we need to be able to apply some form of bonding clip to this cable. With that in mind, with ready access to the shield, you can use virtually any bonding clip that meets your criteria without having to worry about chiseling the shield out of the jacket. The releasing agent is petroleum based and designed to really allow the easy removal of the jacket as well as be a first line defense for water blocking within the cable. Let's take this shield off and see what's inside. As you can see I can nick this shield and now I can peel it with my hands and expose my cable. So as we pull this the shield off some of these things are going to jump to your attention. The first off is the rip cords. So in a lot of cables, they use a very fine cord to cut through the jacket easily. The problem with that fine cord is for the technician. It truly hurts their hands when they try and open the cable. And a lot of times, because of that, they'll wrap it around a tool or certain uh, uh, instruments they have to take the pressure of actually ripping. So what we did is a couple of things. One, we made it bright red and white so it's easily identifiable as the rip cord versus a water blocking agent. The second thing we did is, is we have two of them. Uh, whether I'm trying to do a banana style opening of the cable or the event that you end up cutting one of these off. You have an alternate way to get into the cable. Now we'll show you how easy the rip cords go through this cable. After applying a nick to the jacket for the rip cord to drop into, you'll see that I can take this cord and easily wrap it one time around my hand and start to pull and open this cable up. And you can see it rips quite easily. I'm not pulling hard. I don't have a lot of this wrapped around my hand to keep it from sliding. The cable opens quite easily. 
Now that we have the shield and jacket off of this cable, let's talk about what's underneath. As you start to tear into this cable, you're going to encounter this water blocking ribbon that's wrapped around our buffer tubes. Now those of you who have opened cables before, you're probably noticing the fact that this ribbon is still intact. Unlike our peers, we actually have the ability to make our shield not bond to this ribbon. This is really important in the sense that as I'm applying bonding clips to this cable for installation, I can't have material between the bonding clip and the shield. So with ours, as you pull the shield off, it, it comes off in its entirety and leaves everything else intact. Let's see how easy it is to remove this. What you'll be able to see is with three simple cuts, I can remove all of this material. One cut removes my four water blocking cords. The second cut is to remove the ribbon that holds our water blocking ribbon on. So you'll watch down here at the base, I can make a cut. I can remove this ribbon. And my third cut is going to be for this last layer of water blocking. I cut that. I can take the whole works. Now my cables expose quite rapidly and simply. Now that we have the layers of water blocking off from around our buffer tubes, let's get into the buffer tubes and, and see what they look like. So as you can see, there's two ribbons that are wound around the buffer tubes to hold them in place around the central strength member. These can be easily removed with a couple of cuts at the base. So I'm gonna cut the first one. We're gonna cut the second one. Now that the ribbons are cut, we should be able to slide them off the end quite simply and easily. The next thing you're going to notice, now that those ribbons are missing, is our helix factor. One of the things we tried to take into account with this cable is the fact that the majority of splicing on outside plant cable is actually mid-span access. When you look at other cables on the market, the buffer tubes are wound quite tight around the central strength member. This is doing two things. One, it's adding a substantial amount of fiber optic length to your cable versus the actual cable length, and it makes entering the cable in a mid-span fashion quite difficult. And what you'll notice with ours is that you can take this buffer tube and quite simply and easily wind, unwind it around your central strength member. Now I have access to all of my buffer tubes. Now that we have the buffer tubes removed from the central strength member, you'll notice there's actually a fourth water blocking agent that's wound around the central strength member. The purpose of this is to stop water from entering the end of the cable in open architecture applications. Now, when we talk about modern uses of fiber optic cable, one of the common themes is the apparatuses we're putting them into are getting smaller and tighter. And the buffer tubes have to have the performance to be able to work in these tight applications. So let's look at what the performance of a buffer tube is. So the first thing we're going to talk about is bend radius. In most cables, they try and facilitate a two and a half inch bend radius. We wanted to get it much smaller than that without the technician worrying about breaking the buffer tube. So what we're going to show you now is how tight this buffer tube will go before it's going to kink. As you can see, it's basically to the size of my thumb and there's no kinking, there's no damage, there's no issues with the fiber. Now let's say we took it far enough where we did break it. So let's break it. So we're gonna bend this and you guys can watch it go, 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 and eventually it's gonna pop, right? So right there, the buffer tube has collapsed. Now what's unique is the polymers we chose to use in this application are in dimensions and sizes where when that buffer tube is forced to fail, we don't want it to break the fibers. So as you can see, I bent it or collapsed it right there. Let's open it up past it and see what happened to the fibers. So as you can see, even after that extreme bending and collapse of the buffer tube, it didn't hurt the fibers. The reason behind that is the actual inside of the pipe doesn't collapse. It's the outside that collapses and allows these fibers to survive. Let's talk about what happens to the buffer tube when you crush it. Now, a lot of you guys may be wondering, well, why would I crush the buffer tube? And the simple answer is, Technicians aren't perfect. At certain points, they may shut it in a tray, they may close it in a door, and, and it, stuff happens, and the fiber buffer tube will get crushed. So let's see what happens when we crush it. So this is a pliers. I'm going to take this, and I'm going to squeeze, and I'm going to crush this buffer tube. Now that I crushed it, let's open past the crush and see what happened. As you can see, even after crushing the buffer tube with the pliers, the fiber still walked it off. 
But let's talk about what fiber we chose to go with and why. So first off, we've chose to go with a G.657A1 fiber. The purpose behind that is it is a bend and sensitive fiber, but it does still play well with all of the other fibers that are on the market. Now, as we look at the fiber, you're gonna see it's substantially more vibrant than a lot of the other fiber manufacturers that are in play in the US. The reason we chose to go with a vibrant coating on the buffer tubes is in many cases, the splicing's done in a low light situation. This makes it very difficult to see the differences between say a white fiber and a gray fiber or an orange fiber and a brown fiber. Now as you start to dig into this cable, you're going to notice there's actually a fifth layer of water blocking. This is done for a couple of reasons. One, in the event that this cable is going to be used in an open architecture, it stops the water from migrating into the buffer tube. The second thing it does is it gives pull resistance. And the purpose of why we want pull resistance in our buffer tube is in the event that an excavation contractor finds your cable. We want the cable to be damaged at the point in which the contractor touches the cable. We don't want the fiber to pull out of your apparatuses that are up or downstream from the damage point. To summarize what we've talked about today, We've added orange stripes to the exterior of the cable for easy identification. We've changed the materials that the jacket itself is made out of for bend radius and really ease of technician use of the cable. We've added a releasing agent to the outside of the shield that acts as a water blocking agent and facilitates the easy access to the cable. Inside the cable, we've added five layers of water blocking at every level to stop water intrusion within the cable. We've changed the polymers that the buffer tubes are made out of to make them very, very bend resistant to facilitate any type of application or installation methods you may encounter.